Hi there, it's Beth from the West Dallas Public Library. Welcome to another episode of the Let's Go on Vacation Book Club. This is episode four on our trip to the Great Wall, reading Where is the Great Wall? Before we get started, I want to let you know that I realized I forgot to post pictures of the Terracotta Army for you yesterday. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to post them in two places. The first will be in the comments of this video on Facebook. So if you found this video through Facebook, in the comments there'll be links to videos about the Terracotta Soldiers. I'll also post it on yesterday's video on YouTube. So if you go back to episode three on YouTube, I will have links in the description where you can see more about the Terracotta Army and the soldiers. Um, one of them goes through that they were actually painted as well. So the soldiers also, besides having different faces and hair, they all had different colored um, clothes on too. It's really, it's amazing. Okay, today we are going to chapter seven, Breaking into China. For a thousand years after the Han, dynasties came and went. Few emperors kept up repairs on the Great Wall. After centuries of neglect, much of the wall crumbled into dust. Off and on, raiders from the north still thundered over the border. Though they spread ruin, the Chinese never had feared the nomads taking over their nation. After all, China was big, rich, and strong. The steppe tribes were small and scattered, far apart. Often the tribes warred against one another, and without unity, they posed no real threat to China. That all changed in the 1200s. A strong and fearsome warrior rose up on the steppe from the Mongol tribe. His name was Genghis Khan which means ruler of all men. As a young man, Genghis gathered a powerful army and conquered enemy tribes of his people. Then he worked to unite the many other tribes. Warriors from the far reaches of the steppe galloped forth to join his forces and fight under his banner. The Mongol army swelled to 130,000 horsemen. With his homeland united, Genghis set out to conquer the known world. The Mongols fought their way through Asia and into Europe. Cities fell to the mighty warriors, then entire countries. Within decades, the Mongols captured the biggest empire the world has ever known. Genghis hungered to take over China most of all. China was the biggest prize and the hardest to capture. In 1211, Genghis stormed over the old wall and took control of northern China. Then his forces pushed on south, but there he ran into problems. The dense forest tripped up the Mongols' horses, and China's huge cities defended by massive armies refused to fall. Genghis died in 1227 without seeing his dream to rule China come true. A later ruler of the Mongols, Kublai Khan, was not about to give up the cause. Kublai was the grandson of Genghis. He matched his grandfather's skill and fury in warfare. In 1279, Kublai's warriors forced their way into, Chinese, into the Chinese capital and killed the emperor. For the Chinese, it was their worst nightmare. Not only were the barbarians inside their borders, they ruled their nation. 10 million Chinese had fallen under Mongol control. However, once the bloodshed was over, Kublai led China wisely. He kept the well-running government layers in place. Still, the top levels were now filled by Mongols, not Chinese. Foreigners were also allowed to work for the royal court. This had been unheard of before. Among them was the Italian adventurer Marco Polo, 
whose stories of Chinese wonders spread through Europe. Have you heard the name Marco Polo before? It's a, it's a game that a lot of people play, especially it seems like in the swimming pool. So here's a little bit more about him. Marco Polo traveled to China with his father and uncle when he was just 17 years old. They were merchants and hoped to find riches to sell in China. Kublai Khan, the Mongol ruler of China, immediately took a liking to Marco and hired him to work for his court. After learning the languages of both the Chinese and Mongols, Marco served as a messenger for Kublai. He saw marvels that no one from Europe had ever seen before. After 17 years, Marco Polo returned home. His firsthand accounts of China helped to kickstart a new age of exploration in Europe. Some say his tales inspired the travels of Christopher Columbus, which led to the discovery of the New World. Kublai moved his capital to Beijing in northern China. Beijing remains the capital today. A grand walled palace was built for him in the middle of the city. Kublai and his court lived there in splendor. Even though daily life hadn't changed much, the Chinese hated being ruled by outsiders. The Mongols spoke a different language and had different customs. To the Chinese, they were still barbarians. When Kublai Khan died in 1294, many saw their chance to take their country back. Chapter 8, The Glory Years Genghis Khan and his grandson Kublai were both powerful leaders, but weaker rulers followed them. The Chinese took this chance to revolt. In 1368, an angry peasant uprising succeeded in overthrowing the Mongols and chasing them back into the steppe. The Ming Dynasty was founded. For almost 300 years, Ming emperors would rule China and bring the Great Wall into its years of glory. The Mongols had let the remains of the first Great Wall fall away into a heap of dirt. Why not? They controlled the land on both sides of the wall anyway. So the Ming decided to start from scratch. They built a great wall of their own. The capital city, Beijing, now lay just a dozen miles from the steppe. It was much too close to the enemy for comfort. The project of building a new wall passed from one, one Ming emperor to the next. Each one followed the basic plan set down by the first emperor and then the Han rulers. The insides were still rammed dirt. Towers still linked miles of the wall. But the Ming wall was bigger, better, and more beautiful. Brick and stone lined its walls and base. Nearly all of the great wall that tourists see today was built by Ming emperors. Anyone could build a dirt wall, but walls of brick and stone required special skills. Stone cutters and brick masons were hired, hundreds of thousands of them. The base was made from giant slabs of granite, one of the hardest stones on earth. Working at quarries, skilled stone cutters chipped away at the rock using hammers and chisels. The blocks had to be smooth in order to fit closely together. It was painstaking work. The biggest granite blocks weighed two tons and stood two stories high. Then came the backbreaking job of hauling the granite to the wall site. One way was loading the massive stone onto carts using pulleys and rollers. It took hundreds of mules to lug the carts to the wall. Once the base was put into place, brick masons set to work. They built two brick walls on top of the stone. 30 feet high and 25 feet apart, these walls formed the framework of the Ming wall. Dirt and rubble was packed and pounded inside. So do you remember um, the original, the Qin wall, 
was they would put like bamboo scaff scaff scaffolding and then put the dirt inside and then move the bamboo down. This one, they also they actually built the brick wall first, dumped the dirt in, so then people, I assume, still had to compact it down. So a little different. Countless clay bricks went into the wall. Expert masons baked them in kilns, small ovens shaped like beehives. Holes in the top let out smoke. The bricks had to bake for hours in very hot fires. Once the blazes died, they were cooled inside the kilns for days before being removed. Technology had advanced since the first walls were built. New inventions made some jobs easier. For instance, with a wheelbarrow, a worker could carry loads uphill with much less difficulty. Ropes and pulleys now raised and lowered baskets of supplies. Workers filled the baskets at the bottom of the wall. Then they cranked them up to the top where they were emptied. When the baskets were lowered to the ground, they were filled again. Pulley systems were also rigged over mountain, over mountain ravines. Baskets loaded with supplies swung into the air until they reached the other side. Another thing that the, Ming, that the Ming added were drains to the wall. Ming engineers added drains to the Great Wall. That way rainwater poured out spouts instead of seeping into bricks and causing cracks. Without these pipes, the Great Wall would not be standing today. Despite all these advances, human hands and backs still bore the brunt of the labor. Workers paid dearly in sweat and blood, said historians. By far, the hardest place to build the walls were over sheer, steep mountain cliffs. The Ming Wall followed the natural line of the peaks. It seemed as if the wall grew straight out of the mountains. It wasn't that easy. Workers hacked through solid rock to dig pits in which stone and bricks were laid. Getting heavy supplies up towering peaks was also hard. Human chains, sometimes miles long, passed loads of brick, rock, and dirt from one person to the next. Pack animals helped too. Goats with bags of bricks tied to their horns labored up mountainsides. The Ming emperors weren't satisfied with a wall that was strong and towering. It had to be beautiful too. Bricks were laid in perfect patterns. Carved arches covered gates. Towers were sometimes as ornate as temples. Artwork like this served no military purpose at all. It existed just to please the fine taste of the Ming Empire. And then lastly today, I'm gonna read this little blurb about the last fort. Far west in the Gobi Desert, the Ming built a famous fort called Jaju Juan. They called it the first and greatest pass under heaven. Here's where the Great Wall ends. Its design is a masterpiece and no enemy ever captured it. The stronghold is actually a fort within a fort covering eight acres. A moat surrounds the inner and outer cities. Anyone who enters the fort must make their way through a puzzling maze of gates, towers, and walls. All these are designed to confuse attackers. All right, I'm gonna stop there. We'll pick up tomorrow with Life at the Wall. So thank you for watching another episode of the Let's Go on Vacation book club. And I will see you tomorrow for our last day at the Great Wall. Bye. Thank you.